G'day fellows and welcome to the Ottoman Civilization Guide. In this video we're going to be talking about the Ottomans, we're going to be talking about the best way to play them, we're going to be talking about their strengths, their weaknesses, we're going to be talking about their landmark pathways, we're going to be talking about their unit compositions, their strategic options, and then we're going to be reviewing their unique units. So let's jump into it. Now I'm going to assume that you've already jumped into the game and you've already had a look at the tech tree, that you're familiar with it, that you know what each of the each of the different things does in, in the game, that you've got familiarity with the Imperial Council. Uh, so if you haven't done that, make sure you go dive in. This civilization is available for you for free. Uh, as of today, it will be available. Uh, so go jump in, play it, have an explore. And then once you've done that, you know, come back and then we can sit down and have a, a nice good chat. So let's get into it. W what are the strengths for for the Ottomans? What are the things that we want to try and utilize for this civilization? So for me, a really big strength of the Ottomans is that their military school has a really good synergy with the town center. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean the cost wise. And you might not think of this as a strength, but don't worry, we'll get to it, I promise you. So the town center costs 350 uh, stone and 400 wood. Well, the military school costs 150 wood and 100 stone. So not only do they both cost the same resources, but even the ratios are, are, are quite similar here. Uh, so actually, now that I think about it, the ratios are almost identical. Uh, they're very, very, very close to each other. So with the military school and the town center, it enables you to essentially have villages on wood and stone. And you can kind of decide what you want to do. If you see your enemy going for, you know, a really heavy military opening, then you can be like, okay, I'll drop down a military school. If you see them going for a town center, you can be like, okay, well, I've got a town center. It may it takes the, the question mark out of your macro. If you're playing the Chinese, if you're playing the French, and you see your enemy going for a second town center, you're going to move villages over to stone. But guess what? With the Ottomans, your villages are already on stone. So I think there's a lot of flexibility to be had here. There's also a lot of, uh, quite a lot of longevity in that type of build order as well, because I think it's quite common that, Playing as the Ottomans, typically you're going to be going for a, a, a three towns and a build. Uh, and with that, you can also look to add in things like military campus, which increases the military schools that you can have. So you can really get a lot of value from your stone villages. And the reason why this is important is because it's going to minimize your walking distance in the early game. And it also guarantees that you've got a bit of safety with the resources that you're collecting. So I definitely think this is the first strength of the Ottomans. The second strength of the Ottomans, and this is a bit of a weird one, is their timing push, a military timing push that occurs in the third age. Now, this is done through the Imperial Council and a unique tech that they get called Janissary Company. So it spawns two Janissaries for each military school that you have at your landmark town center. So basically, if you've ever played Age of Empires 3, think of this as a shipment. And you can ship up to eight Janissaries in the third age, which is a, a pretty big amount when you think about it. It's, the, it's, a, it's a lot of resources. If we go do the math right now, you check out the archery range, Janissary costs 160. Uh, resources. So we're talking, you know, more than 1,400 resources, or pretty close to 1,400 resources here, uh, just out of a, a click of a button. So you can really use that timing uh, and, and look to do quite a strong push with that. And we've seen players start to recognize that, start to go, well, hold on a minute. If I look at this kind of early castle age timing and hit this big button with the Janissaries, it can be brutal. It can be brutal. So I, I'm expecting that we're going to see quite a lot of strength from that. When it comes to their weaknesses, though, They've got quite a weak water, or at least this is my suspicion, a weak water. Why do they have a weak water? Well, their water bonuses aren't that good. Now, most civilizations have got, well, rather all civilizations have got water bonuses. You look at the English as an example, uh, they've got a really good uh, water bonus, which reduces the cost of uh, fishing vessels, uh, including fishing boats. Uh, you look at the Chinese, they've got faster producing docks. Um, it's it's down here somewhere, I, I assure you guys. Uh, there we go, docks work 20% faster. Uh, and then you go look at the Ottomans, and you're just kind of like, meow, meow. Movement speed of trade ships and transport ships increased. So this is like a win more situation, right? Like you, you, you're, you're not trading on water until you've won water. And once you've already won water, you've already won the game. So to have improved movement speed of trade ships, it's like, yeah, it's nice, but meh, it's not that good. Uh, so I would say that water is quite weak. Now, the Ottomans also do get access to a unique unit on the water. Uh, it is the Grand Galley. You can see it's available here uh, in, in the Third Age. But once again, at least this is my perception, uh, it, it feels like it comes a little bit too late. I, I feel like this is an irrelevant unit and that typically you're going to be doing most of your damage here. Now, one of the things to note is that this does actually turn into a military school. However, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't give you an extra military school. It just turns into a military school. So you actually have to have a military school slot free for you to do that. Uh, and 
typically you're not going to you know you're going to have your four out of four in the castle age and then you know maybe you hit the imperial age and then you, you then you switch it over perhaps that's the the way but once again it's one of those things where it's like if you've already won the water and you've got no need for it and you've turned it into a military school the game's probably already over at that point anyway so those are the strengths and weaknesses that i've identified so far so now we're going to start talking about landmark order so landmark order or landmark pathway is a way that you can sort of visualize which landmarks you're going to take throughout the game and the ottomans have got two very specific pathways so we're going to start with the least common pathway that you're going to be seeing as the ottomans now i'm going to make sure that i've got cheats enabled uh, and we are going to jump into a game and i'm going to show you guys the pathway and, and sort of the theory behind um the strategic options because the, these this does kind of go hand in hand with strategic options but i'll, I'll just get the, the first one out here just so that you guys are aware of it so the way that it works is this so we'll, we'll make sure that we type our cheat in uh, it's in a jiffy uh which is a cheat which is going to increase the build speed of everything so you can watch this boom house builds instantly so what is the landmark order so the landmark order is the sultan honey trade network so it gives you it, it creates this uh this market which also has traders in it uh so from here you can you know you can create traders and use this and you essentially the idea is that you're trading throughout the game you know you, you've got these guys sent over to the market and and they're doing their things and you're continuing to trade and now because you're trading, uh, and I will give you guys a warning, when I do this next age up, it's going to be very loud in your ears, so I do apologize. So we're going to be going with the Istanbul Imperial Palace, and I'll show, I'll explain the reason for that. There's that noise. I did warn you guys. I'm sorry. Okay, so why, why would you go for this landmark other than the other one? Well, because there's a really, really important Imperial Council tech that you want to be getting. So once you've got the first technology, it's going to unlock the second row, and there's going to be great synergy here for you with trade bags. Now, trade bags is one of the nine technologies that you can get at the imperial council but you can only unlock five of them that is on the condition that you do not go for the istanbul imperial palace which increases that from five up to seven so it enables you to get an extra two techs out of out of the game which is you know it's very very nice to have uh but at the same time there are you know the, these landmarks are mutually exclusive so we want to try and min max as much as possible so uh, by having trade bags though this is a, a really great way that you can improve your income from traders and you know you keep in mind you've been playing trade the entire game you've been trading out here with your traders and so that extra 40 percent it really goes a long way uh, so what we might do is we might just throw down a couple houses here we're going to spam out villagers just so we can get there there we go so we can get our next uh our next uh point and so we're going to chuck it in trade bags and that puts us up and so you can see these guys at the moment they're getting they're pulling back 11 gold which isn't that hot uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, we've got our traders that are now pulling back 16 gold. So that's that 40% coming in there. And so you've been trading all game. You've been having a, a beautiful game and you've decided, all right, it's time to go to the Imperial Age. Where are you going? You're going to the Western Digital Fortress. No, not really. You're going to the Seagate Castle. Uh, so this is a landmark that really buffs up your trade. So it acts as a keep and it's also going to be buffing up your traders. Not only does it increase their movement speed, so you can see at the moment, they go from one movement speed up to 1.4 tiles of movement speed. That is insanely quick. Let's see if we can get a trader down here just to see. So this guy's buffed up, but he won't be for much longer. 1.4 He'll be out of the radius. Or he's already out of the radius. You can see it's an absolutely huge radius uh, that the Seagate Castle's got. But I'm sure you can already see where this is going. So you've been trading in the early game uh, through the Sultan Honey Trade Network. And then you've utilized the Istanbul Imperial Palace to get that extra trade bags point that you wouldn't have been able to get that otherwise. Now, the reason why I say that you wouldn't have been able to get that otherwise, I mean, technically, yes, you can invest into it. But if you do invest into it, uh, there's a there is a what, what, what's the best way to say it it's it's a mutually exclusive system and there are better things that you want to be going for so you're going to need to take a tier one guaranteed now typically you're going to be looking into anatolian hills but siege cruise is really good in the late game you're also going to want to have military campus as well so that's two and three already taken out of your five and now that leaves four and fifth remaining which gives you fast training which you're also going to want and then advanced academy is a really 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 nice one to have here but also janissary company is pretty damn decent as well if you're thinking about doing one of those timing pushes so it kind of leaves trade bags as like the last thing so you can take trade bags early definitely and you can even take it without the istanbul imperial palace but if you do it means that you might not be able to take out you know fast training or advanced academy or military campus and as a result it makes more sense to be picking up this nice and uh in, in the mid game but final uh, final uh, finally uh with the seagate castle so you can see our trader here is on a movement speed of one tile uh, but that goes up to 1.4 movement speed so it's it's this is a raw increase of 40 percent uh of your revenue because this isn't uh this isn't sort of like adding on this is scaling 
because it's an increase in movement speed uh, on top of that already large 40% bonus that you've got. So typically when you look at, at a, an upgrade, so as an example, if we drop a lumber camp down here and we look to get an upgrade, okay? Our base gather rate here uh, is, let's say it's one. But when we get the 15%, that goes to 1.15. And now with another 15%, that goes to 1.3. Okay, and another 15%, that goes to 1.45. So these, they they stack, but they don't scale together. I'm not, or they don't add up together multiplicatively. Uh, instead, what they're going to be doing is, is well, not, not being multiplicative. Uh, that is a hard word for me to say. Uh, whereas here, it is a multiplicative uh, add-on because you've got that the, the movement speed plus the higher carry capacity. Uh, and that's what makes this synergy really, really strong. So that's what the first landmark is. Uh, pathway looks like we'll take a look now at the second landmark pathway uh, which is what i would say would be your land landmark pathway probably 95 percent of your games you're probably going to be going for this just because i genuinely think this is one of the best landmarks in the game uh, so we'll make sure we type in in a jiffy because we'll be there in a jiffy uh, so we're going to be starting off with our twin minaret madressa uh, so this landmark is just an absolutely insane landmark. Uh, it, it is incredible. And the reason why this landmark is so good is because it extends out the life of your food. Basically, think about this as, as well, you can see right here, there's a little berry bush that's spawned in. And this spawns a berry bush every two minutes after that initial berry bush has been exhausted. So it regrows. So once you deplete this, so if we come over here and we deplete this now, I think we'll deplete it pretty darn quickly because we've got Inner Jiffy on, uh, which is kind of like, you can see all of our villagers just going crazy. That's going to deplete any second now. And now... now get your timers out two minutes from there that's going to respawn so you want to you want to get on this bad boy as quickly as possible you want to make sure that you are eating up all of this food as quickly as possible and then what you're going to do in your downtime is go back on to your food and then as soon as they come back up you're going to move everybody back over onto berries and you're going to make sure that you're constantly eating out those berries and that's a lot of food you're talking about 700 food that's cycling in every two minutes for free that's a massive amount of food and it means that you you can delay your farm transition which is a really, really big thing. Uh, and, and part of the reason why I think this landmark is so strong because when you start stacking it up with things like Anatolian Hills, uh, which I will just quickly show you. I apologize. You're going to have some very loud dings in your ears very, very shortly. Here it comes. Get ready. There it is. Uh, so Anatolian Hills gives you eight sheep. Uh, and so now you can you know, bounce even further between this going from your berries, go to go to your sheep. You might use up four or five sheep in that time that you're down from the berries and then you go back to the berries and then you back over to the sheep and you're just bouncing between them. So it makes a lot of sense to be going into that. So that's the first landmark. The second landmark in this pathway is going to be the MIA, the Mehmed Imperial Armory, uh, which we'll drop down here. So this, this landmark is going to be producing uh, siege for you. You can see right there, it is producing siege like a madman because we've got Inner Jiffy on. It's really not that fast. Uh, so this is a landmark that is just, well, you, to be honest, you're probably not going to get a lot of benefit out of the other landmark. No, nowhere near as much benefit as you are from this landmark. Uh, and this landmark is going to synergize very well with your fourth age landmark, which is going to be the Istanbul Observatory. So for this civilization, the Ottomans, they're producing units through their military school. And this is produced at a specific rate. So if we turn in a jiffy on, uh, give me a sec, in a jiffy, I should probably copy paste that. Uh, so that I can just turn it on and turn it off at will. All right, let's let's try that. Okay, so we can see here that it is it, it's quite a long time. A spearman takes a minute and I think it was a minute and six seconds. Let's put on something a, a bit more real. Uh, maybe maybe a spahi because you're going to be training lots of spahis. So a minute and forty seven seconds. That was what I saw. Now as soon as I drop down my barracks, or sorry, my blacksmith on, on top of it. Let's just get a whole bunch of vills on it. That way we don't have to turn in a jiffy on and off again. Uh, that's going to reduce the time down on that uh, on that spahi down to well quite a significant amount shorter, down to a minute twenty now. So it's dropped it down by twenty five seconds. Now that also affects the MIA, but you can get that down even further as you go through the ages. That goes from twenty five to thirty three to forty percent. But with the Imperial uh, or the Istanbul Observatory. That's going to go down even further. That go that goes to 60%. And that, once again, starts stacking with this landmark because it is also affected uh, by this. So we turn on Inner Jiffy. And now we've got uh, a mangonel that is produced uh, once every 1 minute 50. And you can see our, our Spahi, uh, they're also going to be produced... Uh, yeah, one minute and six seconds. So not too bad there. Uh, so you've got really strong synergy between uh, the, the MIA uh, as well as the Istanbul Observatory, as well as just the general play style for this civilization, focusing on your blacksmith. That's going to be a big factor. Military school blacksmith 
I have seen players, Casper, uh, one player who actually played the Ottomans without any military schools. He's like, you know what? I'm just going to play the Ottomans without military schools. But to me, that kind of feels like playing the Abbasid dynasty without fresh foodstuffs. It's just, it, it, it just doesn't, to me, it just doesn't make sense. You've, you've got to try and take advantage of this. Uh, and the devs have worked out the balance to try and get this in, in, the, in the perfect little spot. So I definitely think that uh, you will see pro players go towards the uh, towards this this as uh, the typical landmark pathway. I think trade is definitely something that's unexplored or even under or I guess they made the same thing underexplored and unexplored at the moment. Uh, but I would expect that, that it'll be coming out on a couple of different maps. But it's it's just very easy to shut down, and that's what makes it so difficult to hold on. All right, so we've talked about uh, the we might we might turn these off. Give me a sec, just so that they're not producing any units, uh, and then that way uh, we can actually get our own units out and start talking about the compositions that you can start expecting uh we might even do we just i think we just restart the game right there so we're going to move on to unit compositions now and what is the best way to play the ottomans or at least this is this is my perspective uh what, what are the best ways to play the ottomans because you know what you might you might have a different perspective and that is absolutely okay so we'll turn inner jiffy on i'm going to just drop down a couple of houses okay and we're going to put on uh and we'll age up so we'll go with our twin minaret madressa Okay, and so if you're in the uh, the feudal age uh, and you're going to be fighting it out, typically the way I've found the, the best way or, or the, the most success is you're going to be wanting to drop military schools. So we, we'll drop our military schools down. We've got two military schools. And these guys are both going to be on Spahi. And the reason why we do that is because Spahi costs food. It costs a lot of food. If we take a look how much a Spahi costs, it actually costs more than a normal horseman. It costs 110 food. So every, every Spahi you get is free food. Now, why is free food good? Because food is what we're moving around the map for. Food is the reason why we're getting out of our base. We've got gold in our base, and this will last us until 15, 16 minutes. We've got stone in our base. We're not going to need more stone until we're thinking about dropping castles or, or, or keeps down. Food is the main issue. Now, we've got plenty of wood in our base. This is probably going to last us until the 22nd minute easily. So we're not fussed at all about the other three resources. The big one is food. We're going to be moving out to our berries. We're going to be looking for our deer hunt. We're going to be moving out for more berries. So we're going to be even thinking about going out to the boar, but obviously we can't do that as the Ottomans. Uh, but it, you, typically that, that's going to be the, the, the main focus of civilizations to look to get out for food. So any way that you can get free food is a great way because some people would look and think, oh, well, I'll, I'll just put it on archers. Well, you can put it on archers. That's fine. But then you're just getting free wood. And it's not really like you don't have any wood accessible, is it? You've got plenty of wood accessible. So typically what you would expect... Uh, players, or at least this is what I ex expect the game uh, to play out as, is you're going to have players. We do have a spearman come out. I, I did forget to cancel the spearman on that one. Uh, so you're going to have players massing up large amounts of free Spahi. Uh, they'll be probably be adding in their own, maybe a meta or two. Uh, so let's let's get a meta, a couple of Spahi out there. Uh, but the main thing that you're going to be seeing is a big, big, big mass of archers. That is what the Ottomans are all about. Just making a lot and lot of archers, getting out a huge amount of archers, uh, and the reason why is because you've got so many things that can supplement this. Uh, and by that, what I mean is you've got your free Spahi. The other big factor is the meta. The meta's got a lot of synergy uh, with this. By having higher attack speed on your archers, it makes them a lot more potent. Because archers are going to be overkilling. So typically, you look at 10 archers and you think, 10 archers, that's that's not a lot of archers. And you're 100% right. So if we if you get like a, a reasonable amount of archers, that what, what would you see in, in the Feudal Age? 30 archers. But we're talking 30 times 5. That's 150 damage. That's almost enough. Well, it's not really enough to one-shot a Spahi. Uh, but it, it's more than enough to overkill a Spearman. If you, if you take a look at a Spearman right here, uh, this Spearman, he's sitting on 80 health, no ranged armor, and he also gets bonus damage. Well, they also get bonus damage against him. So you're overkilling this Spearman by an absolute country mile. So the way that you can kill Spearman faster is either by having better micro. So that would mean that if... Let's, let's just drop down a Rax right now and just get a whole bunch of Spearmen out. Uh, but if you had some absolutely crazy micro uh, where you could focus down individual Spearmen, so that would mean like you'd have this as... Uh, and th this is something I used to do in like Age of Empires 3. I remember I would have control groups of skirmishers and I would have uh, th four groups of five skirmishers because five skirmishers would one-shot a musketeer. And so you'd go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, like that. And you would be cycling your units, killing enemy uh, spears off. That's a great way that you can improve your damage per second. But the reality is, is not everyone's got the micro like that, uh, especially when, when there's so many damn units on the field. So the, the best way that you can do that is to increase your attack speed because your 
units are now firing faster and that's what the meta does and that enables that great synergy there between the ottoman civilization and this big archer mass so when it comes to your unit compositions the most common composition that i expect that you're going to see at least for the ottomans in the early game is archer Spahi. That's going to be the big one. I don't think there's going to be a huge necessity on spears. Maybe just enough to, to throw them in. Or if, if, you're, if you're up against those knight matchups, maybe it makes sense to get a, a few more spears out. But for the most part, large archer masses are what the Ottomans are going to be all about. Moving on to the second composition. It's a bit more of an interesting composition. I'm a big fan of this. And the reason why I'm a fan of this is because it, I don't think it was really viable uh, in the last... Uh, in, the, in the last patch, but the, the dev developers have updated it. We're going to just drop that landmark down a little bit further away. Uh, apologies for the uh, the loud siren. So the next composition that we're going to be talking about, let's delete all these units because they're not going to be relevant, is going to be Spahi, and get this, Janissaries. So Janissary Spahi is a pretty cool combo. So let's talk about it and, and the way that it works. So Janissaries are very effective against every unit, except for ranged units. So if you're facing up against a meta arm, or if you're facing up against a spearman, they're going to do very well against that because they've got 16 base damage. So they slice through that, kind of like a crossbow. If we have a look at the crossbow, crossbow's got 12 base damage with a 9 heavy. So it's, it's 21 versus 16 damage. So it's, it's pretty similar amounts. Um, the, the only difference is, is the Janissary does 4 extra damage against everything. Um... I actually haven't compared attack speeds. Let's compare attack speeds just quickly. Uh, so we've got 2.12 over here with five tiles of range. And then we've got 1.75. So there's quite a big difference in attack speeds. I'm sure if we bring the meta over here, that'll probably even be uh, pushed out even further. 1.81 uh, versus 1.53. So you can see they've got quite a faster attack speed as well. Um, but that's that's not all that they've got going for them because even against the men at arms or against the spearmen, while they do a lot of damage, uh, and and they will 100% absolutely counter both of these units. Uh, no question, no no two ways about it. Because you've got micro that you can always pull in. You know, if you get surrounded, you're always going to be able to fall back. Uh, but the other big thing is that they've got a, a very strong counter to cavalry. They get an extra bonus of 16 damage against cavalry. So that means that they're going to absolutely destroy enemy horsemen. They're going to absolutely destroy any form of enemy enemy cavalry whatsoever. With the exception of maybe like the Manganai or the Horse Archer for the Rus. I think maybe the Horse Archer for the Rus could be a real problem for this unit. Uh, but obviously, uh, we, we, we digress because when it comes to going for unit compositions, they are compositions. They are more than just one unit. So your Janissary is going to be taking out enemy knights. It's going to be taking out your enemy horsemen. It's also going to be taking out the men at arms and the spearmen. The Spahi's job is to kill all the ranged units. And that's what it excels at. It gets bonus damage against ranged units. Now, it, it also has the fortitude ability, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it definitely has a, a bit of a, a niche or a bit of a, a chance uh, to come out. So this is 100% my favorite composition uh, for the Ottomans and what I expect most players playing the Ottomans to probably go into once they once they realize that th this has got potential. You're most likely going to be seeing once players have moved up into uh, into the, the Castle Age and they've looked to pick up Advanced Academy. So this allows your military schools to produce Janissaries because at the moment, uh, if we take a look... Oh, oh we've, uh, we've made a little bit of a mistake. That's okay. I'll, I'll fix this up. Give me a sec here. Uh, let's just produce a whole bunch of units really, really quick, and that's going to pump up our score. Boom. I'm just going to delete all these all these gens. Uh, so when you've got your military school out, so let's let's just drop down uh, a military school here, a military school here. We're going to delete this, and we're going to drop our blacksmith in here. So your military schools can't produce genissaries, but all of a sudden, once you've got advanced academy, then you can. And you really want to try and produce genissaries. Uh, excuse me. Did I not? I thought I clicked you. I mustn't have. Uh, so you want to be producing Janissaries because just like the earlier argument where food is the uh, is the resource in the early game, gold becomes the resource in the mid game. That's be it definitely becomes uh, one of the main issues. You know, typically by the time that you're looking to unlock Advanced Academy, it's about the 20, 25 minute mark. You've you've made your farm transition. You're probably sitting on about 40 or 50 farms. You're quite capable of spamming out Spahi like an absolute madman. And so that becomes the main thing that you're spamming. You're still making Janissaries, but you're going to be getting a, a large amount of them through this uh through through the free unit mechanic at the military school so that's the way that you're you're going to be thinking about your mid game um, and now the last component to this composition is going to be siege and this is a, a, a common theme throughout the ottoman uh play style it's siege and part of that reasoning is because of the mia the mehmed imperial academy now you can see that we or rather mehmed imperial armory uh, now we don't we didn't take that here we took the istanbul imperial palace uh, but it's the other landmark and that produces siege for free you also want to make sure that you always build it around your blacksmith so you're, you're always wanting to have siege presence you always want to be trying to 
have Siege out on the field that your enemy's going to need to respond to, whether that be through their own Spring Lords, whether that be through uh, a cavalry attempt. But remember, with that, let's say that you've got uh, a couple of uh, a, a couple of Siege units out. So we'll drop down our Siege Workshop here. And we can see our Janissaries popping out. So let's say we've got a couple of Mangonels out uh, in, in the middle and your enemy tries to do a, a little bit of a cavalry surround. Well, all of a sudden, now you've got your Janissaries. And keep in mind, your Janissaries, they're quite a short range, okay? They don't have a huge range. But now you just stand on top of, of your... Uh, on top of your siege just like this and now they're going to get beautiful coverage of that they're going to pick up the bonus damage there against the cavalry it's going to be so difficult for your enemy to try and hit you with any sort of attack from that from that uh, that play style you can also go with like a, a a line formation like that try and block them out try and get in on top of them if you want you know maybe cancel the line formation just really get in on top of the siege they're basically like pikemen with a ranged attack and that just increases their dps so much it makes them such a strong unit uh, so I think that this this is a really good composition uh, to be going for in the mid game. Uh, so now we'll talk about the next composition, which I think is probably going to be a little bit more... Well, I, I think people are probably going to have a little bit more problems with this because this is a bit of a weird one, okay? I don't think, I, I don't think many people have really thought about this one. So the first unit that you're going to be making is the, the veteran archer. So we're just going to get a whole bunch of archers out. This is going to be like the meat and the potatoes of your army. Uh, I don't know if you're probably going to make 65 archers. It seems like a, a lot. But the next unit that you're going to be making are Janissaries. And so the idea is that you want to be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with your enemy's ranged units with your own archers. You just want to be spamming out archers non-stop. You want to make sure that you've got, you know, your archers are killing enemy crossbows. Your archers are killing enemy archers. They're killing basically, you know, everything. And then when the enemy finally decides, ah, you know, stuff this, I'm just going to make knights. I'm just going to make, uh, I, I'm just going to make horsemen. Well... Look what you've got. You've got Janissaries ready to go. Now, one of the reasons why I think this composition is really, really good. Well, let's have a look at a very a common composition that we do, top, t do typically see in the Feudal Age. It is going to be Spearmen uh, with Archers. So this is a really common, um, a really common uh, combo that we see in the, uh, in the Feudal Age. Spearmen and Archers. And what most commonly happens, like let's say you're playing uh, as, you know, French against the Chinese and you don't want to go Shugunu. Uh, so you d you're going to be going archers. So the way that it's going to be working is you're going to be trying to defend against uh, the enemy knights uh, and make sure that your archers aren't dying. So every every time that happens, you're going to be pulling your archers back and moving your spearmen forward. And when that happens, the enemy's archers are going to be looking to try and pick off your spearmen. But now all of a sudden, because your spearmen are ranged in the form of janissaries, they don't have that ability anymore. And I think that's what makes this combo very, very interesting because all of a sudden, your one weakness, which was enemy archers, is now completely neutralized by the fact that you've just got ranged Janissaries. You can just keep these on the front line. Now, I, I still think that there's going to be weaknesses. Like, as an example, if you're up against an English player and they're going longbow knight, this is going to be really hard against them because the longbows are going to be able to, to attack over the top of your of your archers and hit your janissaries and the knights are going to be able to come in on the front side but still the longbows are going to be able to pick apart your janissaries so it's going to really come down to micro but the final uh the final combat or the final unit that, that rounds out this combination here because it is really important and you may have identified what the weakness here is the weakness is enemy mangonels so the last unit that you want to be rounding out this composition with is going to be a springled so the springled here in this composition the composition is going to enable you uh, uh, to maintain siege superiority and it means if your enemy tries to get a sneaky mangonel in because keep in mind a mangonel uh, will actually counter uh I'm, I'm pretty sure it actually counters all of these units uh actually no i, th I think no it, it, I, I take that back the mangonel will counter the uh, archers but it will not counter the janissaries they did change that so the janissary used to get countered by the mangonel it doesn't I'm sure it still gets pretty pretty dis pretty well destroyed by the mangonel as do most things uh when they're all bunched up like this but I still think it's probably going to be very important for you to include Springlords, at least, you know, three or four Springlords in there, enough to take out enemy uh, Mangonels. So that's going to be my my three favorite unit compositions for the Ottomans and what I think is going to be uh, the the best uh, way for the way for that you can play, sorry, the best way that you can play them. Uh, but now we're going to move on to the next part, which is about strategy options for the ottomans and the the easiest way that, that you can play uh the ottomans when it comes to this civilization and you know the, the mindset coming in because you think of uh, of the mongols right like what what options as the mongols do you have when you enter into a game you come into a game and you're like option number one i can tower rush option number two i can tower rush i've got option number three which is also a tower rush you see what i mean 
when it comes to the French. It's like, okay, well, option number one is I can open knights. Option number two, oh, no, uh, you get my point, right? So as an example, with the French, you've got a, a number of different things. You can go, you know, full feudal. You can go for a second TC. You can go for a fast castle. You can go for like a semi-fast castle, that sort of thing. That's more the vein that I'm talking. So what are the what are the strategic options available to you now remember i will go through build orders in a different video you can see already we're at the 30 minute mark in this video so it is getting quite long so i can't actually go over build orders here but just to explain it so the first one that you, that i would expect that you would see is dark age aggression now why would you see dark age aggression out of the ottomans and it is because you want to take advantage of the military school uh so we're going to get in a jiffy down here so you, the sooner that you make the military school, the sooner you start reaping the rewards for it. The military school acts as a, you know, as an uvu or as a unit producer, a resource producer, a static resource producer. So the sooner you make it, the sooner it starts producing resources for you in the form of units. So it makes sense to try and get it out as quickly as possible. So I think when it comes to strategic option number one, it is definitely going to be dark age aggression. Whether you look to follow this up with an outpost, whether you just look to age up behind this, there's a lot of synergy in some of the options. As an example, you go for the Twin Minaret Redresser. As soon as you age up, you drop down a second. Uh, you drop down a second military school. And as we talked about before, because there's a lot of synergy between uh, the gathering, you, you know, you probably got quite a few villages on wood, quite a few villages on stone. And you say, well, you know what? I'm going to drop down a second town center. So this is what I, I would probably say is going to be the most common way that you see Ottomans played. So that's Dark Age aggression into a second or even a third town center. Uh, and I've got a specific build order on this. I've got a game that I played against a Muslim uh, where I used this strategy and it was quite successful, I will say. Even though I didn't win the game against a Muslim, it wasn't because of my strategy. It was because he was a very good player uh, and I'm quite mediocre. Uh, so that is, that is the first way that I would say that you would be looking to play the Ottomans. When it comes to the second way to play the Ottomans, I think this is a bit of a... a, a I guess you'd say kind of like a, a standard way. Most civilizations play this way, and there is synergy in in the the strategy that we're oh, that I'm talking about. So the Ottomans start with an extra fifty stone, and the reason why they get that is because it makes their military school a little bit easier to reach. They can send out five villagers out to the uh, out to the stone outcropping here, uh, and and get f uh, fifty stone from it, bring it back to the town center, and then place their military school straight away. But what that means is they're also fifty stone closer to a town center. So with the twin minaret madrasa. You can drop that one down in a jiffy. Uh, and then because you've got that extra 50 stone, and if you didn't spend it in the Dark Age on that military school, well, you can just drop it on a second town center and straight away. So the build order that I've got at the moment, I think I get the second town center down at 4 minutes 50, which is a pretty quick second town center. So I do suspect that's probably going to be quite a fast uh, build order. And the, the follow-up to that's probably going to be, you know, pretty similar, you know, military schools. Uh, drop down and then you know typical playing defense in the in the feudal age uh, until you can find a castle age window that sort of thing so that's probably going to be the second way the second the second strategic option that you've got for the ottomans when it comes to the third way to play the ottomans i still think that this is probably one the the last one that might be up in the air just because i'm not 100 percent sure of the way that it's going to work and I, i've kind of got like it all planned out in my head but i'm not sure uh you know e exactly how viable that's going to be so the way that it would work would be one base. So you wouldn't really be thinking too much about stone. You'd be playing it a little bit weird. So you'd be going for the Salt and Honey Trade Network. And then from there, over the course of the game, let's get in a jiffy going on here. Uh, so you might be trading out. Let's let's trade over to this side of the map. Let's get a couple of traders out here as well. Uh, and so, you know, we, we've got a few traders going out. You can see our villager taking longer to build the house than our trade network taking to, to get the traders out there. Damn, girl. Where'd you find that? Uh, okay, so we've got our traders out there. They're just doing their thing. And so you can imagine, you know, we're, we're playing just a normal game and we've got our traders. This is probably a bit more safe. Like, I'm, you can see we've got the trade post here. So maybe I'll put a market down here in the corner. And for anybody wondering about how to do that, let me just let me just uh, do that uh, now just to demonstrate that because that, that's quite an important thing uh, that's going to be relevant. So from here, you're, you're just going to be playing the game out standard. The idea is that you want to protect your trade line, as is most trade games. So you're going to be thinking about walling up the edges of the map, that sort of thing. You know, you want you want to try and uh, make sure that you're protected, that your trade line's okay. You're going to largely be playing around cavalry. Uh, now, I did think... Yeah, I took Anatolian Hills, but I think going for this kind of strategy, you'd probably want to go for meta drums because this increases the movement speed of your units in formation with the meta. Uh, so you'd be looking to, to play quite a heavy cavalry style here and looking to defend your trade line with cavalry. So you'd be getting a lot of those bad boys out. Let's get some houses down here. There we go. So you'd be getting a lot of cavalry out. Get your meta out as well. 
I think I just made a scout. There we go. Uh, so th the meta would be running around the map. You know what? Let let's get a couple more units out as well, just so we can get that meta, uh, that meta bonus. All right, so n now with the meta bonus, all of our units are going to be running a little bit faster. We're going to make sure that we move the scouts out. Uh, and so because we're trading, uh, and we can see we're, we're about to start trading down here. So how does this work? Let's delete all these traders. You can see they're pulling back 143 gold, which isn't too bad. That's an entire map. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this... Let, let's say that this was the actual map and my enemy somewhere over here. How would I try and take advantage of this map as best as possible? What I'm going to do is I'm going to build a market down in this corner as far away as I can. I'm going to right-click the market with my Salt and Honey Trade Network, and then I'm going to hold Shift, and I'm going to click here. And what that's going to tell my market to do is it's going to say, hey, when you create a new trader, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to set your home trade point to this market. And then I want you to go and collect gold from this trading post. And now if we build a trader, you'll see it just walks straight out over to here. And you can see it's already set this down as the uh, the trade point. If you have a look at at the uh, the AI, it does very quickly do it. You can see it kind of works itself out. Uh, and then so what we're then doing is we're just playing one base and we're going trade. That's the idea. So in the event things go things go sour in the event that you do get raided, you're always going to be able to fall back towards this backup plate where you can put your uh, your traders inside the Salt and Honey trade network. Gets you a nice little bit of gold. I think it's like 160 gold or something like that. It's nothing too crazy. Uh, but assuming that, you know, ideally you don't ever want to be doing that. You never want to be playing your game and having that uh, because that is six population that is basically just going to waste, especially once you start talking about the late game. So now you can see our traders have moved across the map. Now, don't expect these guys to be pulling in 143 because this is, you know, this is pretty much a, a cross map uh, market. So I, I reckon these ones might be pulling in like 90 or something because this, this trade post isn't the best. Uh, but let's have a look. 106. So not too bad. 106 gold. I I'd be pretty happy with that in a game like this. Uh, and we've also reduced, significantly reduced the travel time that it takes for the first, uh, for the first little, um, the, f the first voyage. Let's just put it that way. And it, it means that you're going to be able to get that, that 106 gold in a lot quicker. Uh, but from there, uh, you're essentially just playing off one base. That's the whole idea. Uh, when it comes to spending your points, uh, and let's get a couple more of these bad boys out so that we can get our next point. I apologize for the sound. There it goes. You're going to be looking to get trade bags. Uh, that's going to be, you know, a, a relatively early uh, thing. Uh, now that's not going to immediately transfer over. So tra trade, bo trade bags doesn't work on existing uh, traders. It will only work on the new ones. So if you're about to get trader or trade bags in and you've got a whole bunch of traders about to hit the trade post and pick up their gold, just hold on to them, wait, and then, then hit your trade bags because you're going to be reaping the rewards. I think, what were we, 106 down here, which is going to mean that our traders uh, with trade bags are, are going to be, what, 149? Let's go with 148. 148, there we go. 148. So not too bad so an, an extra uh, 42 gold on top of of the normal one so it instead of adding in those additional town centers here you're going to be just playing trade and i think that the developers are, are really looking to shake up the game with regard to trade they've already shaken it up a huge amount by reducing the cost of traders as well as reducing the time it takes to make traders so uh, you can see here that it takes 25 seconds for a trader to make it used to take 45 seconds so they've they've basically they've halved or almost half the time it takes for you to create a trader so it's an important thing uh, to consider that the devs genuinely want trade to become a, a thing. Um, so with that being said, uh, we continue moving forward and, and talking about the, the, the sort of strategy here. So my suspicion would just be from there. You go into the Ist Istanbul Imperial Palace and then you're going to be looking to... I, I would suspect you're probably going to be looking to try and get up to Imperial as quickly as possible here to try and take advantage of your trade. Uh, and so... One of the reasons why uh, that you would be looking to go for the Istanbul Imperial Palace, it's not actually because you took trade bags. The reason why is because you want to try and get to this to help you. Uh, this one right here. Oh, we don't actually have any military schools, so we, we can't even take it. So you would, you would still be making military schools. It's an important part of uh, the play style of this civilization, I think. But one of the things to note is you've only got three military schools because you did take trade bags. Uh, so to go into this, to go directly into this, to go to military company, uh, or rather Janissary company, you're only going to be getting six Janissaries in. So you can see, uh, where are they? There they are. So you've picked up six Janissaries. So you can use these to kind of defend. Now, obviously, you've got a, a giant mass of 61 Spahi. We're just going to delete those. Uh, but you can use this to kind of to defend as well and to hold yourself on a little bit longer. It might be what you need to, to tide you over until you get to Imperial. And obviously, once we get to Imperial, 
then, you know, you guys already know exactly what's going to be happening. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Seagate Castle. So the Seagate Castle is going to be dropped down. Now, one of the things to note with the Seagate Castle is that the aura does linger. Uh, so when you do place this landmark, you're typically going to want it uh, kind of in the middle of your trade network. But at the same time, you've got to appreciate where you might need to have more than more than one keep. So we're just going to put it like smack bang in the middle of, of the trade network, which is technically the worst place for, for you to have the keep, I would say. Uh, because if your enemy wants to shut down your trade, they can just wall out your trade post or just kill your market. That, that That's pretty much the best way for your enemy to shut that down uh, is to just hit one of those two things. So putting it in the middle kind of does really does nothing. But by putting it at the ends, you're really not taking advantage of that uh, that aura. Now, of course, you can just place a keep down here, uh, and that's going to be a, a lot different, but you can see, just what, watch how big the aura is. So that, that guy gets buffed up now. That's going to continue extending out uh, for another 10 seconds. So you might even make it all the way to the trade post, but as soon as these guys uh, come in, they're just going to be, you know, it, it, it's just pumping it out. But I guess, like, with that being said, you could probably just easily drop down, you know, a couple of keeps. I reckon you could probably drop a keep right here, and then maybe drop a keep over on this side, like, right there, and then that keep is going to defend the market, and then the other keep is going to defend... Uh, defend the trading post. So you could probably get away with something like that, but uh, you, yeah, you can essentially see where that kind of synergy comes in uh, for this play style, this build order. Uh, but yeah, that is it. All right, so now we're going to move... I mean, uh, th that's essentially it for the uh, the strategy option. So you've got strategy one, which is the Dark Age aggression uh, into the second or the third town center, which is my favorite. The second one, which is the far second town center. And then the third one, which is one base, but you're trading. We're going to talk now about uh, unique units and specifically what I like, what I don't like um, because there are definitely some units that I love and there are some units that I absolutely cannot stand. Uh, so let's get Inner Jiffy back on. Let's get ourselves up to the Imperial Age because we're going to need to get there because we've got some big boys to talk about. You guys know what I'm thinking. All right. Let's start with the biggest boy of them all. Uh, we're going to be talking about this guy right here, the Great Bombard. Uh, I'm not a fan. Not a fan. It's expensive. It's very expensive. 1,500 resources. Gets very easily taken out by enemy Culverin. And keep in mind, uh, Marlians have got access to the Culverin as well. Uh, and that's not even that's not even mentioning the fact of like Mongol 13 range Spring Ords, Rus 12.5 range Spring Ords. This has just got a massive target on its back. Now, you've got upgrades for, for this. You know, when the when you get the university, uh, you're going to be able to get things like Siege Works, uh, which is going to increase the health of the Great Bombard even further. But it's still going to make it a big target, and it's still a, a huge target. So, if you need to take down anything quickly, you need to, if you need to take something down in a jiffy, you're going to need a great bombard. And the problem is because it's so expensive, and it, it, it's such a if your enemy takes it out, you're not just losing a, a a bombard, you're losing a great bombard, and that really really hurts. So, I, I I'm not even kidding you. I've I've actually seen a comment from a pro player who said, "I want the great bombard to be great." but I really just wish I could make normal bombards. And I felt that way before as well, because when you look at the siege capacity of this unit, yeah, it's great, but it's also really, really difficult to keep it alive. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, I'm not a big fan of this unit. Now, to be fair, once you start massing them up, once you start picking up all the upgrades, you know, once you've got greased axles in, uh, so it's got a little bit of movement speed on it, once you've, once you've gone all the way down to siege works, uh, and you've got the buff up. Let, actually, let's get let's get a couple of uh, of buffs in just so we can, uh, can we can show them off because you can really start to stack up the buffs here. So let's get this guy down here. Uh, let's get a meta as well. Uh, did we not get a meta? There we go. There's our meta. Uh, so with the spearman, it's going to buff up the attack speed. So at the moment, it attacks once every 7.75 seconds. I want to. Can we attack ground? Let's have a look. I think we can. So we can attack ground. So 7.75. So one attack every 7.75 seconds. And then you jump a Spearman inside after getting Siege Brews from the Imperial Council. And that's going to increase that attack speed up even faster. Now, obviously, we can't see that attack speed because, well, the technology is not, not there. Let's just put it that way. Uh, but we'll bring the meta over here. And we'll, we'll bring two of these guys out just so we can see the difference. So remember, it was 7.75. And now it's 6.64. All right, so now they're both attacking at the same time. And now we're going to add the Spearman in on the bottom one on the next, after the next shot, immediately after the next shot. All right, there goes the Spearman. And so now we're going to slowly see the difference between these two. Now, keep in mind, it's already being buffed up by the meta. But you can see how fast that DPS starts to, to move away from the, from the Great Bombard. 
just purely because of the power of siege crews. Uh, so this is part of the reason why I think Siege Crews is so damn good. You, it, it's a must-have. It's a mandatory. If you don't have Siege Crews, you're making a mistake. Because it just means your, your potential DPS is, is really, really poor in the late game. Um, so with the exception of that, though, it, it still remains a very, very expensive unit. Um, and even though it can take advantage of things like the, uh, the attack speed bonus from the meta, uh, it can take advantage of Siege Crews. To me, it still feels like a real Debbie Downer, unfortunately. Um, and keep in mind, I mean, Siege Crews, you, you can just... Do, do, you, do you dare want to see Mangonels with reduced reload time and meta buff and a, a, uh, and a Spearman inside? Just w watch this. Just, it's, it's ridiculous. Get out. Get out of there, Spearman. I see you. All right, so you got this bad boy up here attacking once every five seconds. And then you got this guy down here who's attacking once every sh every two seconds. I don't know. It's not really. But, I mean, you, you can see the difference and, and how it starts to build. So just just by adding in that Spearman, I mean, Siege Cruise. I, I know this is meant to be about unique units, but let's just talk about Siege Cruise for a second. Aye, aye, aye. Uh, anyway, let's move on to the next unique units. Let's get rid of these ones. Uh, so the next unique unit we're going to be talking about uh, is going to be from the archery range. It's going to be the Janissary. Uh, I'm a big fan of this unit. I love it ever since they changed it. Ever since they buffed it up, uh, it has been an absolute menace out on the field. Uh, so the reason how... Or why did they buff it up? How did they, they change it? So it used to be considered a ranged unit. So if we take a look at, at a normal archer, you'll see that it's got a tag on it. Light ranged infantry. Ranged is the key word here because the Sparky and the Horseman get bonuses against ranged versus ranged. A nine versus ranged. Can you hear this guy? Yeah. Get out of here. Get your drums out of here. I'm like, what is that sound? It's a damn little, damn little meta. So the spy he gets a bonus, bonus nine damage uh, against that. And keep in mind that that in the in the Imperial Age, like that that goes absolutely ham. Uh, if we take a look here, uh, you know, thirteen bonus damage. So th throughout the game, that's just going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. So with the um, with the Janissary, the way that it got changed is it used to be light ranged gunpowder infantry. Now it's just light gunpowder infantry, which means that the Spahi doesn't counter it anymore. But it still does take extra damage. You can see it receives plus 50% ranged damage uh, from, from Archer. So this Archer here does five bow damage. So it does an extra 50% damage. So 7.5 uh, is, is what you can think. And it also, this one does an extra five damage against light melee infantry. Well, this isn't a light melee infantry. It's a light gunpowder infantry. So it doesn't get the bonus damage. But it still gets the bonus 50% range damage. I know it's confusing. Just bear with me. So the Janissary, it's an absolute powerhouse. We've talked about it earlier. It counters the Spearman. It counters the Men at Arms with Micro. Uh, it counters the Knight. It counters the Horseman. It's an incredibly strong unit. Uh, the only thing it loses to is Archers. And because of that, I think it, it's uh, it's fast enough to, to um, almost escape archers. You can see right there, if we compare it to the uh, to the crossbowman, the crossbowman's got the same speed. The archers are faster. So you're going to need to protect them with maybe mangonels or something like that. But for the most part, Janissary, incredibly strong unit. Uh, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we do see this really start to penetrate the meta. Uh, the main thing to note with this unit, very expensive on the gold side of things. 100 gold. And so this this is part of like my, my thinking as well is because I think the Janissary has got the potential to be so strong, it kind of makes trade more attractive because with trade, you've got that infinite gold source coming through. So don't be surprised if we really start to see like one base Ottoman trade into Janissary Fast Castle. I don't know, like just something ludicrous with just mass Janissaries and Mangonels and oh, it's just, it's going to be beautiful. I can already see it. It's going to be absolutely beautiful. Uh, but yeah, Janissaries go crazy once you start getting all the upgrades as well. So we can get the elite upgrade. Uh, and then on top of that, so elite upgrade is a static amount uh, based on the existing stats, but then you get an extra three damage on top of that. So it makes them a little bit formidable. On top of that, you also get access to chemistry, which increases their damage by 20%. So now you're talking about 28 damage. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. Really, I think this unit, it's its pretty damn good for its cost. Oh, and did I mention it can also repair Siege at half the speed of a villager? That's pretty cool. It's its nice. You know, have you ever been in that situation where you're like, you're in a Siege war and it's getting really clutch and you're like, damn, I sure wish I had eight villagers out here to repair. Well, guess what? Now you don't need them. Now you can just pull all your Janissaries and just start repairing that, that one Siege unit. Now, obviously, when they're repairing, they're not going to be shooting. But still, it's nice to have that flexibility. Uh, next unique unit that we're going to be talking about uh, is going to be the Spahi. Another bow, bow. Uh, Yeah, I'm not a fan of this unit. I, I don't like it. Uh, so the differences between this unit and a standard horseman are that this one is more expensive. 
This one costs 110 food, where a horseman costs 100. Uh, and this one's got a useless ability called Fortitude. <laughs> uh, that is about it. Now, I think there might be a couple of other differences. I think it like might have a little bit of extra health or something in there, like a, a slightly faster attack speed. I, I don't remember. I just remember, I remember someone saying something about it being slightly different. I'm like, bro, that is not enough to justify like how terrible this unit is. Like you look at the longbow, okay, versus a normal archer. The longbow gets two extra range. The longbow gets an extra damage. What does it lose? Well, it's a little bit more expensive, like the Spahi, and it's also a little bit slower. 1.25 speed for a normal archer, and a longbow does 1.12. Like that's that is a unique unit, bro. This is not a unique unit. This is a this is this is a terrible unit. That's what that is. Like this is just this is the worst trade deal in the history of trade deals. It is not a good trade deal. So look, I I do like the Spahi. I think it's got a very cool model, but I think Fortitude at the moment needs a little bit of a rework. I, I would be happy with like maybe gains. I don't even know if gains 50% attack speed is like the, the right way to do it. Like maybe gain 50% attack speed, but I don't, you know, I, I just don't like, oh, did, did I mention the fact that longbows also have like three abilities? They can put down, <laughs> they can put down those palings. They can do the healing circle and they've got that do, 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 do ability in the Imperial Age. <laughs> Bro, come on. <laughs> the the Spahi are just useless. Anyway, uh, by the way, you want to see something funny? Five Spahi go to a wood line against 10 villagers. The Spahi use fortitude. You want to know who wins? <laughs> it's not the Spahi. They're not, they're not, it's not fun. Let's just put it that way. Okay, anyways. Look, I hope that Fortitude gets revisited or I hope someone changes my mind. I don't know. Maybe there's someone out there who knows something I don't know, but every single time I've seen Fortitude used, there is, there is one circumstance where you can use Fortitude. You're in a fight. You have won the fight. Your enemy is retreating from the fight. You can now use Fortitude. But guess what? Because they're retreating... As, as as they're running away and your Spahi is attacking them, it's got to run up to that unit to attack. And so it's not getting that bonus 50% attack speed. It's not standing right next to it just like, ooh, 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 ooh. It's like, ooh, and then it has to run. Ooh, ooh, ooh. By the time it's already run that distance, the Spahi has already recovered its attack speed for its next attack. I can't remember the exact numbers, but I'm pretty sure someone did the math on it. A villager with wheelbarrow running away from a Spahi takes 3% more damage when Fortitude is activated than when Fortitude is not activated. That's how small of a difference it makes. 3% difference. It's it's irrelevant. It is useless. Do not use it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> next unit that we're going to be talking about. Uh, this is this is a big oof. I love this unit. The matter. One of the one of the coolest units in the game, definitely. This guy bangs his drum hard. He goes real hard. Uh, does he change his drum depending on what you're doing? No, it's always the same drum. He, he likes this drum. Look at him. He's a he's a he's a right-handed guy. You can tell. Yeah, there we go. Now and he's got the double fister. Well, watch out, Drongo. <laughs> so I'm I'm a big fan of the meta. I love it. Uh, it. It's just it's such a great unit, uh, especially in the um, in the feudal age. This unit just absolutely pops off. The extra attack speed. It's amazing all throughout the game. We've already talked about it. It's great in the Feudal Age if you want to have your archers out. It's great in the Imperial Age if you want to get your siege covered. Uh, it's really, really strong. When you're going for raids and you're taking your Spahi, make sure you put it on ranged defense drums so that your Spahi can have additional ranged defense. Now, keep in mind, these are Imperial Spahi or Elite Spahi, but uh, you can get some serious numbers with these bad boys, like just to just to give you a bit of an idea. So if we... Let, let's uh, take a look. We'll drop down a, a Blacksmith. We'll research all of our melee and we'll also get a knight out and make it elite. This knight has eight armor and then you put you put the meta onto it. It's got 10 armor. That's insane. That is a crazy amount of armor that it's got. Uh, and it, you get a lot of cool break points from this as well. So as an example, you know, uh, with uh, Chukunu in the late game, Chukunu have 11 damage that they do. Uh, so they absolutely shred through knights. But now all of a sudden... Uh, you, you put this uh, ranged defense drum on and now they've got 9 armor instead of 8. So it means that you're taking off 33% of their damage. That's a huge amount of uh, of, of cutting through the damage. Uh, so definitely a, uh, a really strong uh, unit throughout the game. And this is another thumbs up for me. So overall, these four units all get thumbs up. 
or rather, I should say, the, the Genesary gets a thumbs up, the Meta gets a thumbs up, the Spahi gets a thumbs down, the Great Bombard gets a thumbs down, and of course, the Grand Galley. I mean, do I even bother showing you guys the Grand Galley? You know what? We'll do it just to, just to be, just to get the achievement, like the completionist achievement, the Grand Galley. But it's like, it's such a meme. I, I feel like even showing it, it's just kind of like, is it even worth it? Like, what, what am, why am I here? Like the Grand Galley often asks that same question. Like, why do I even exist? I'm just a Grand Galley. Uh, but we'll, we'll show it. But anyway, I, I'm going to I'm gonna give that one the thumbs down before I even show you guys the, the Grand Galley. All right. I'll show show it to you in a jiffy. All right. Let's get, uh, let's get that dock down and we'll drop a house down here as well. You guys will all chop a tree in a jiffy. Cheats are not enabled. No, cheats are not enabled. Oh my god. So cheat the, the, the box for cheats doesn't carry across. Everything else carries across into the next game. Like all the all of the uh all of the options, but cheats don't carry across. So I've got to allow cheats again uh so that uh, I can I can in a jiffy it up. Because I tell you what, I ain't sitting through uh I ain't sitting through four minutes of landmark building to show you guys a a useless <laughs> useless warship. Now I am sure that the devs might have like an official, not an official response, but like an actual response where it's like, well, Drongo, I mean, yeah, you're right. The Grand Galley, it's not the best, but at the same time, it's got some cool upgrades. Maybe it does have some cool upgrades. Uh, you know what? Let's let's check that. Maybe it's got some cool upgrades. All right. Istanbul Imperial Palace. Oh, sorry for the sound. Oh, it's, it's loud, but I think I warned you guys in time. All right. So Grand Galley. It, it's cool looking. I, I'll, I'll give you guys that. Let's get a couple of these bad boys out. Look at this. Oh God, the sound. I forgot about the sound. So the Grand Galley comes out. Uh, so when it comes to the text that we've got available, uh, do we hit the Imperial Age? Let's just go Imp. Maybe, it, does it... I don't even know. Okay. Uh, Imperial Fleet. Increase the production speed of gunpowder ships by 15% and their movement speed by 15%. So gunpowder ships, uh, that's a Springled ship, that's an Archer ship, that's an Incendiary ship. I'm assuming that's my Carrick. So if I get this, this has got a movement speed of 1.25 and this has got a movement speed of 1. That went up. That also went up. So it affects both of these. Uh, and it also, what else does it do? It did something else. I can't remember exactly what the tech did now. Uh, we can double check the tech tree. Give me a sec here. Uh, dock. And then we go and have a look at the... It's an Imperial Age tech. I guess that makes sense. Increases the production speed of gunpowder ships by 15 and their movement speed by 15. You know, if there's one thing in the Imperial Age that there is not enough of, it is production speed increases for my gunpowder ships. And I'm just glad that the devs identified that specific black hole and have now filled it because that was 100%. You know, when I was looking at a new civilization, I'm like, I want a water bonus. What do I want? Do, do I want, like, faster gathering fish? Do I want, like, a larger carry capacity on my fish? Do, do I want, you know, some cool, unique tech? No. I want my gunpowder ships to train faster and move faster. Slightly. Just slightly. Let's go look at what other techs they've got. Because it doesn't really look like a lot in here. This is all just uh, standard stuff in here. Uh, and so, anyway, you, you can turn this into a military school here. Um, but obviously when you convert it into a military school, that's it. That's it. Cool bananas. Um, I, I already had seven military schools on land. Not really, but you guys get the point, right? Like you, you, you're out here paying. Let me just, let me do some quick math here. Uh, 300, 660, 7, 810 resources for a military school. You need to head back to math school to learn how not to pay for military schools because it's just it's it's just i mean we've talked about bad trade deals this is a whole nother level of bad anyway guys that's gonna be the unique units wrapped up i hope you guys have enjoyed this video this video this video uh this has been the civilization guide for the ottomans now we're gonna be doing a deep dive into ottoman build orders as well which is going to take you through every single opening that we talk about you know we talked about in the beginning uh the potential strategic options that you've got the first one being a dark age aggression the second one being a fast second town center and then the third one being a one base trade so we're going to go through each of those build orders so make sure you stick around make sure you catch that one because uh you're not going to want to miss it if you're an ottoman main and uh thank you for watching we'll catch you guys in the next one